Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to uh, the generations past, present and future. Also, I would like to acknowledge the hard work that ACA put into this um, conference. And lastly, I would like to welcome you and um, so that you took time in, the, in your busy schedule to attend this conference. So welcome. A bit of my background, um, I am a psychotherapist, a mindset and performance coach, and a mindfulness trainer. I have been fairly active in the workplace trainings in the last couple of years, helping organizations to reduce the levels of stress within the workplace, as well as improving um, mental health and um, engagement and productivity. So we will talk about what mindfulness can uh, do for us. I know that most of you put actually your hand up uh, when I asked who has a regular mindfulness practice. Who doesn't practice mindfulness? Can I just have a show of hands? Who, who, is, who is kind of very new? Okay, so we'll, we'll cover for both ends. We'll, we will go through, um, um, we'll go through the session in a way that is um, important or that you can basically take out good points if you are not if you're new to mindfulness as well now I would like to start this session with a mindful conversation because ultimately I think that's what we do as counselors as, as therapists as mental health workers we're allowing the people to talk to us in a way with presence so that they start opening up so I'm going to invite you to find a partner, maybe someone that you haven't worked with today or is someone that you don't know. Let's use this opportunity as a networking opportunity at the same time uh, in pairs. And then each person is going to get 90 seconds to talk about these two questions. What do you love about your work? And what are some of your biggest challenges? So we're not going to go so deep in a counseling session. Um, so if you're speaking, I'm going to ask you to actually just have a free flow conversation with the person right in front of you. And if you're listening, just noticing those urges to jump in and ask questions and uh, speak up your opinion, you'll get your chance. Let's um, leave the person uh, some space. Only 90 seconds, we don't have much time today. And if possible, can we do this practice while we're standing up? I know you've been sitting pretty much all day. So let's stand up, let's have a bit of a stretch. Let's move around in the room. Okay, anybody would like to share a couple of things that um, they, lo they love about their work? Anyone? What do you love about your work? Diversity. Diversity, yeah, working with different types of clients. Different types of clients and doing different things. Wonderful. Anybody else? Volunteering. Volunteering. Yes, great. <laughs> okay, thank you. So what are some of the challenges? I know it could be a challenge as well, being, becoming a, or being a counselor. That could be um, certainly a challenge. Any challenges that are out there for you? That needs to... Pardon? Case notes, yes. I remember those days when I used to work in a psychiatric hospital and yes, those case notes, yeah. They do take a lot of time and you have to be very specific, don't we? <laughs> Anything else apart from paperwork? Burnout. Burnout. Yeah. So definitely we'll talk about and how mindfulness can actually help with that self self care. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with a why. I think it's really important to understand what is happening in our world today so that we actually and you know, get into that practice of mindfulness because we understand the why. Um, for the ones who are very new to mindfulness, please don't worry, we will introduce the concept, we will have a working definition for you and we'll, um, we'll talk to you about how it works. We will look at the neuro neuroplasticity and the benefits of mindfulness uh, based on the latest research and science. We will have mindfulness practices along the way as we have already started with a mindful um, mindful chat. We will look at resilience and how to improve it. And at the end, I'd love to leave you with an action plan. So based on what we talk here today, what will be one or two things that you can start implementing in your life that will make a difference? Because people often say uh, knowledge is uh, power. Now, knowledge is only potential power. It becomes power only when you use it. 
So my take to action, a call, call to action from this workshop is finding one or two things during this presentation so you can start getting into a daily habit of this. Okay, my journey in mindfulness. Now, it really started in 2006 and it was a very difficult year for me. I was going through a lot of family issues. I was in a job that I didn't really like. And I think most importantly, I didn't have a meaning or purpose to wake up to. This is way before my training in counseling and psychotherapy. And I had very limited knowledge about mental health. But I knew that something was really off. So I went to see a doctor, a neurologist at the time, and talked to him uh, what, what was going on. He did some tests. The tests came back okay, but he said that I was depressed. So I looked at him and I asked, what can we do about this? He prescribed some antidepressants, which I happily took, went back home. Um, and I remember very vividly taking one of those little tiny pills, expecting to doze off to sleep and waking up feeling wonderful. Right? <laughs> How naive I was back then. <laughs> Pretty much the opposite effect happened. It felt like my brain went into fire. I was having these random bizarre thoughts that I never had before. I couldn't sleep all night. I was erect the next morning. I immediately went back to the doctor and told him what had happened. He looked at me and said, it will take four to six weeks until your body gets used to the medication so that we can start seeing some impact. And at that time, I think a part of me Probably the wiser part of me knew that I had to find another way to deal with what I was going through. I already had a suicide attempt before, and I kind of knew that I may not get through another six weeks without um, doing something else. So this was the starting point of my journey of mindfulness. I booked myself into a 10-day silent meditation retreat. Now, if you do have clients who are going through major depression or a lot of anxiety, that wouldn't be the way that I would suggest for them to start their journey. Uh, I would really in, encourage you to in, you know, um, ease them into the practice uh, slowly. This was a very challenging time. I, uh, basically, we, were, we had to uh, surrender of all of our personal belongings, including car keys, money, no books, no writing. It was myself and my depressed mind at that time. And talking about a mental institution locked into that place, sitting with my crazy mind, this is when I started to notice, oh my God, my mind is pretty crazy. And in mindfulness terms, this is what we say, the monkey mind, right? That thought patterns, the monkey mind jumping around from one thought after another without having any logical thought sequence. And this is what I was able to observe for the first time. Now, I... I really wanted to run away, by the way, around day three. I'm just bored. I'm kind of, I just need to get out of here. This is just way too much. Um, but they make it really difficult by taking all of your stuff away. And they were <laughs> that stuff was locked in in a place uh, which I didn't have access to. And how far could I actually go without money or car keys in our Western world? So in that moment, I made a conscious decision and said, you know what, no matter what happens here today, or well, within the next six days, it was luckily, luckily day four, I'm going to stick here. I'm going to stick around and let's see what happens. Around day six, something started to shift. I had no idea what was going on, but I was having those moments of peace, maybe a minute or two within an hour practice. Not much, but it gave me hope. I've started to feel like, okay, something is definitely shifting. Now, please also remember this is 2006. Not so much research about mindfulness back then. And to be honest with you, I didn't really care that much. I was feeling better. At the, at the end of day 10, I was like, wow, what happened? So I started to take some drastic changes in my life after that. One of them was actually quitting my job. Now I do a lot of workplace trainings within organizations. And when I start sharing my story, whoever booked me in, the HR manager or the owner of the organization starts looking at me, John, what are you talking about here? We don't want our employees to quit their jobs. Just my story, right? Hear me out. Um, I had to change something. So I quit my job. Actually, I um, left the country. I used to live in Europe. I packed my bags and six weeks later, I was sitting on an airplane coming to Australia. This is how my journey in this beautiful land started over 13 years ago. So if I'm speaking here to you today, 
I think one of the reasons is the daily practice of mindfulness in my life. So it did change my life, if not saved my life. I'm pretty sure if you are practicing this on a regular basis, you're seeing the impact in your own life. I use this with all of my clients and see the change that they go through as well. So definitely something that works and we will look at the signs also. But let's begin with why do we need this? Why do we have to be mindful um, in, this, in this age, which, is, which kind of looks like this. Anybody feels like that from time to time? Yes? Okay, I, <laughs> depending on, I, I do run my own uh, business, so sometimes I go, like, oh no, this is how I feel. We certainly live in a very volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The times are changing, the technology is shifting. I'm working with a lot of people who, are, who may be just losing their jobs, especially in the financial sector. Now, I also listened to a podcast. Um, it was a U.S. podcast, and it was talking about U.S. Army trialing out an online counselor, a robot, AI, um, to detect um, depression symptoms in soldiers. So if you think our jobs are very secure, maybe, I'm not so sure. So um, apparently this um, AI counselor, it, they weren't doing deep counseling, by, by the way. This was just about um, identifying early warning symptoms in soldiers. So the AI robot counselor was very effective in terms of detecting um, the facial expressions, the tone of voice, and they were getting some really good results. So watch this space. I'm not sure what is waiting for us in the, in the counseling field, but this is certainly what we face. Um, anybody feels like this when they turn on their computers? Yeah, information overload. <laughs> How do we deal with all of this? And now let's have a look at what's happening with our attention span. Now this was a study done in Canada by Microsoft and they specifically looked at our attention span while we we're searching the net. Our attention span in year 2000 was uh, uh, 12 seconds. Not very long, is it? No, um, a dramatic decrease in year 2013 went down to 8 seconds. Now 8 seconds of an attention span is actually 1 second less than the attention span of a goldfish. Now the question then is, how do you want to be effective and productive in whatever you're doing if your mind is constantly wandering off? When you're sitting with those clients, what are you thinking? Are you fully present or is your mind somewhere else? This is what's happening with the use of technology, our devices, checking them on average 100 times per day, some people more, some people a bit less, checking emails constantly. Um, so our devices kind of became um, tools for destruction for us because we don't want to sit with stress. That's when we turn into devices. And for some of us, we actually look at our devices more than we look at our partners, don't we? Who wakes up with their devices? Nobody. Oh, great. You, okay. <laughs> okay. I was going to, okay. We, because like, when, I mean, being in the mental health field, I think you all know what, what really happens when we do that. We, we are activating the stress response. But for the general public, this is the way they wake up. They wake up, they start checking their phones, they start checking their emails, and they're activating the stress response uh, straight away from the first moment that they wake up. Now, our brain is plastic. So experience-based uh, neuroplasticity means that the brain's capacity to change in response to environmental stimuli and learning. And that really is based on our experiences. So based on your experiences, your brain will be shifting each day, depending on what you're experiencing. And your experiences are based on what you really pay attention to. So ultimately, we become what we pay attention to. On top of this, we have the negativity bias. And I know that it was very useful back in the days um, when we were, um, for our ancestors, right, living in the caves, and they had to be vigilant. They had to notice where the deadly animals were or the poisonous berries were. It was part of their survival system. Now, a couple of thousand years later, we're sitting with a really similar brain structure. Although our environment changed a lot, our brain hasn't really shifted that much. So if let unchecked, 
your mind will be focusing on what is not working well for you. Anybody can relate to what I'm talking about here. And the ratio is actually 1 to 7 in some studies, 1 to 8 in others. So meaning that one negative experience will wipe out 8 positive stuff that happened to you on that day. Um, yep. So what do we do about this? Uh, hint, hint, hint. Gratitude practices work really well. We will um, have a closer look at what, what it does. Um, but this is our responsibility and this is our responsibility to educate our clients to say, you know, if you don't do anything about this, your mind will be magnifying what is not working well. So how do we take charge? What can we do? And I think you know the answer to this question <laughs> is mindfulness, which is really training our mind, training our attention to be here and to be in the now. Now I can see your body sitting here, but I can't see your mind. Now our minds have this incredible ability to just wander off into the past, into the future, worrying, maybe daydreaming, criticizing, judging, catastrophizing, whatever else your mind might be doing, but it is rarely in the present moment. So let's define what mindfulness is. And I'd like to use a definition by Rick Hansen, who has been doing some phenomenal work in the field of mindfulness as well as uh, resilience. And he defines um, mindfulness as staying present in this moment as it is moment after moment, rather than daydreaming, ruminating, or being distracted. And I like this because it's very simple. There's nothing specific about this. It's just a simple term, just staying present in this moment. How easy is this? <laughs> Not very easy, is it? Not so easy. Because what happens is, most of the time, we're running like this, being in autopilot, distracted, attention in the past or in the future. I hope... Most of us are not like that, robots um, on the first picture. Um, so what mindfulness helps us to do is get out from an autopilot into self-awareness, being aware in the here and now, just noticing what is happening right here, right now. And according to research um, by a US psychologist, Matt, Matt Killingsworth, he did some research on mind wandering. So he created this app, or they used this app, um, and it was a study sample of 15,000 people from 73 different countries. So this was a global study. And they sent these people three questions. First one was, what are you doing right now? Second question, what are you thinking right now? And a short time later, a third question came, how are you feeling? So what the research found out was that 47% of the time, globally, Almost half of the time, people were not actually present with what they were doing. They were in autopilot. You may ask the question, what is so bad about mind wandering? Um, also, a strong correlation between mind wandering now and being unhappy a short time later was found in that study. Can I ask, who would like to improve their levels of happiness here? Can you please put your hand up? I, th I think it was most of the room. Okay, great. Here, we got a tool for you if you start putting into practice. And when I say practice, we're really talking about five to ten minutes of daily practice that will shift your life for the better over the long term. And I'm really inviting you to actually keep this practice up for the rest of your life. Is that making sense? Are you up for it? Great. You're easy to convince. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at... Um, I think let's do a, another five-minute practice. Would that be okay with us? So in terms of mindfulness, there is no um, specific posture that you have to uh, get into. There are four main postures that you can practice mindfulness. One of them is sitting on the floor, on the chair. Um, second one is lying down. So if you want to lie down, feel free to do so. The third one is standing. So you can also stand doing this practice. And the last one will be walking. So my invitation to you will be, you know, try different uh, um, postures, try different practices, see what really works for you. And en encourage your clients to do the same. Mindfulness get a really serious rap sometimes. It's like, yep, you just got to sit down on the floor, you got to do it, you got to observe your breath. And when that happens, when it becomes really serious, most people don't want to practice it because it becomes a chore. 
the way to get mindfulness into the mainstream is, is to make it playful. And today we're going to explore some of these techniques that you can actually start using uh, with your clients, if you, if you wish. So for this mindfulness practice, uh, you can sit on your chairs, that's absolutely fine. If you want to have another posture, that's fine too. My invitation to you will be either closing your eyes or lowering your gaze so we minimize the distractions. And that's the only reason. If you don't want to close your eyes, just looking down at one spot so you won't get distracted. We'll talk about some micro practices um, and I would start encouraging you to actually bringing these um, um, practices into your day. In between your sessions, after a stressful meeting, just let things go. This is a way to do it. Like taking a couple of minutes, just having some deep breaths and letting go so that you can actually prepare for what is coming up next for you. Whatever that might be, maybe your next client or your next meeting. Just building these things in. So it's not a formal practice. So I just do, do my mindfulness 10 minutes in the morning and then I can be unmindful during the rest of the day. It doesn't work that way. Mindfulness is, a, is an art of living. So basically cultivating these qualities within our waking hours. Just training the attention, just noticing. This is really about noticing and being present. Now, if you haven't noticed, there's a bit of a mindfulness revolution happening in the world. And here are some of the major companies that are using mindfulness um, within their organizations because they just see the benefits. So most of the global ones, such as Google, Accenture, Sony, Microsoft, they're using mindfulness to enhance employee health and well-being. So what is the relevance for us as mental health practitioners? A um, couple of studies that, that I would like to um, talk about. One of them is a 2007 study that found that mindfulness training for psychotherapists has a positive impact on the treatment results of their clients. And I think this is not a surprise, is it? When we can be present with these people that, that are right in front of us, we can connect with them in a deeper level. So... You know, that, that really works. Um, Dr. Dan Siegel, the author of Mindful um, Therapist, he says the presence of the therapist to be available to relate to the internal world of the, of the client is the most important aspect of healing. And I couldn't agree more with him. You know, our presence really matters. So how can you start improving your levels of presence when you sit with those people who really need it. And also for the people who, you know, outside of your um, professional life, your loved ones, you know, they want your presence too, by the way. <laughs> I often say people don't want your presence, they want your presence. That's the best thing that you can give to them. And most of the time, this is what we're missing now, isn't it? Caught up in technology, caught up in our devices, we just miss this human connection. So this is why mindfulness is really important to actually cultivate in this technology-driven age because we are losing parts of our brain um, that has been um, hijacked by technology. Um, now, this is a study that I love um, because it really found that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is as effective as uh, antidepressants without any side effects. Now, I'm not against drugs. Um, I think that they do have their place in our world, but um, you know, they can be certainly overprescribed. And my own personal experience was not a good one with them. So I think I'm a little biased. So I prefer mindfulness um, than drugs. And the good point is the effects actually stay with, with you when you start practicing mindfulness. You're changing your brain structure and it, it stays. With the drugs, when you stop the drugs or when your clients stop the drugs, I have seen many relapses. I used to work in a psychiatric hospital and this is what would happen. They would come in, they will stabilize, put on new meds, and then they'll go out and then come back in a couple of months later because they relapsed. Doesn't actually happen with mindfulness. Okay, so what are the benefits of mindfulness? And when we talk about benefits, I'm not going to go through this all because we really have an hour and I would like to give you as much as I can. This is usually a half a day training for me. So I compacted everything in one hour. That's why I'm going really fast with the slides. Um, so what I'm going to invite you to do is um, to have a look at these benefits. And if I had a magic wand with me today, 
And if I could give you one of these benefits, which one would you pick? Which one would enhance your life for the better? And you can only pick one. I've got some good news for you, which is that when you start practicing mindfulness on a daily basis, as most of you do, they come as a package. You don't have to pick and choose these benefits. They come as a package over the long term. Once again, not a magic pill. This is, this is a training. It's a bit like going to the gym and training. This is the training for the mind. Now, I'm going to, we're going to continue with a um, five-minute um, video uh, by Dr. Sean Shapiro, who talks about the neuroscience of mindfulness, what really happens in our brain, and we'll convene after that. Some of the research that I think is most interesting and, and actually most optimistic is the research on meditation and the brain. So I want to give you just very brief background. This has nothing to do with meditation. But basically, positive and negative emotions look different in the brain. So when we're feeling happy, joyful, vital, alert, we have higher left-to-right ratios in our prefrontal cortex. When we're feeling depressed, anxious, um, in fact, even people who have post-traumatic stress disorder or severe depression, we, have much, we see much greater activity in the right-to-left ratio in the prefrontal cortex, which is this part of the brain that developed um, more recently. So when they did a study on meditators, they brought in this um, Tibetan Lama, and what they found is that his left-to-right ratio was much higher than any of the other 175 subjects they brought into the laboratory. And so they asked, is this just a random artifact, right? Was he kind of born happy, and so then he decided to be a monk and a meditator and meditate? Or did the tens of thousands of hours that he had dedicated to this practice actually have an impact? So they did the gold standard, which is a randomized controlled trial. They took 41 biotechnology employees who had never meditated. They, right, if they can do it, anyone can. <laughs> um, they randomly assigned them into a, a mindfulness group taught by John Kabat-Zinn or a weightless group. And then they looked, is there change in the activity of the brain? And what they found is that four months later, there was significant differences in this left-to-right ratio, where they had much greater activity in left-to-right with greater positive emotions, vitality. This is extraordinarily hopeful. And I want to explain why, for those of you who aren't psychologists, in psychology, there's something called a happiness set point. And it's been repeated over and over again in the research that we find that people basically, just like you have a weight set point, you basically have this kind of continuum of happiness that you're born with, and you can't really move it too far. So what they found is that when you win the lottery, you have this initial blip of, yes, life's going to be great forever, and then a year later, you're back to your baseline level of happiness. If you're in a terrible accident and you become a paraplegic, you have this huge dip, and then within one year, you're back almost to your baseline. When I first read this, I thought it was shocking, so surprising, and yet they replicate it again and again. So this is great news if you're born happy, right? It's like, <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, you get divorced, you lose your job, whatever, and you just pop back up. It's like you're a bobo doll. <laughs> This isn't such good news for, for most of the people that I work with who are coming to see me where they weren't necessarily born happy. And so even if you work really hard and you make a lot of money and you get the house in Hawaii or you win the lottery or you marry the perfect person or you have, it, it doesn't actually change your happiness level. What is so hopeful about this new research is what it says is that even though changing your exterior circumstances, winning the lottery, doesn't change your happiness level, changing your interior landscape can. Changing our interior environment through training the mind and heart and body in these practices can actually shift our levels of happiness. Richie Davidson, who is the principal investigator of the study, he says, happiness can be trained because the very structure of our brain can be modified. So what he's talking about here is neuroplasticity. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. Does this remind you of anything? Right? It's exactly what this monk told me. 
what we practice becomes stronger. Everything that we practice, every single moment matters. So these are brains from Harvard. I think that makes them a little more special. <laughs> um, and basically, Sarah Lazar did this wonderful early research, and what she found is that meditators, the actual parts of their brain that have to do with attention, concentration, emotional intelligence, compassion, those parts of the brain actually get stronger, bigger. It's, what, it's called cortical thickening. And that this thickening is correlated with practice. What we practice gets stronger. So the way I like to think of it is we have these super highways of habits. And they're just like, they're well-grooved pathways in our brain, right? They just, you know, they're what we automatically do. And what mindfulness is helping us start to do is to kind of like build, kind of like, I, th I think of it as like digging a country road. You're, you're, you're clearing all the brambles in your brain. You're creating this new neural pathway that's like, oh, I'm in actually do it with compassion this time, or with a little more patience, or a little more presence. And so instead of going down that same superhighway of habit, we're shifting and we're going down a different pathway. And every single time that we do this, we're strengthening that pathway so that eventually that pathway becomes the habit. That makes sense, right? So what we want our clients to do is getting into that daily habit of practicing mindfulness. And each time they do it, they're doing it, they're carving out a new pathway in their, in their brain. So it takes time, it takes practice, it takes dedication. I get that. Sometimes I don't want to do it. But it's like whenever it becomes a habit, it, then it becomes like brushing your teeth. So you just don't think about it. You just do it. Okay, so I started to include mindfulness or micro practices in my presentation because one of the reasons is um, in the workplaces, they come to me like, John, you don't understand. I don't have 10 minutes. I can't meditate. I can't do that. Um, so I go like, well, okay, then do you have like a minute in between meetings? I was like, yep, I got a minute. All right, then can you do actually a micro practice, which I'm going to teach you and then you can actually start teaching this to your clients because... I know that we're all very busy, but if we can get like five micro practices in a day, that's like a five minute practice. So we're actually tricking our mind a little bit. I don't know, I've got to sit for 10 minutes. We're like, okay, so let's divide this up into, into pieces. So can I just ask for you to stand up for a moment, please? And let's, uh, let's take some deep breaths into, into our belly because as we all know with stress, we just get short breath, a lot of shallow breath. So I'm going to invite you to just breathe in all the way down to your abdomen and breathing out with a really loud sigh. It's going to look like this. It's sometimes a bit weird. Ah. Can we do this three times? The louder the better. Without choking. Ah. One more time. And notice what that even does, that three breaths after a stressful meeting, after a challenging client. It's a way to reset your central nervous system. So I'm, we're going to do a one-minute practice. This is literally a minute. You can do it in one minute. So uh, three uh, points. Um, we're going to pay attention to our breath, noticing what's coming in, what's going out, uh, relaxing our body as much as we can. And then we're going to connect our, with our intention, just asking ourselves what is important now at the end. So you can keep your eyes open during this practice. Maybe just looking downwards. Now, this was literally one minute. So the question is, how can you implement this into your day? Any ideas? When can you do this? Anytime. Well, anytime, yes. My suggestion would be, Whenever you feel the overwhelm, the stress, something is going on, you just need to shake things off, do a micro practice and connect back with your intention. Start living a life of intention. 
I see many people who just show up. It's like, oh, what am I doing today? It was like, well, I'm just going to show up and see what happens. So when we just show up, we just live the life to the randomness. So I really invite you to become more intentional. What is important for me today? What is important when I meet that client? What is the intention for the session? Having it loosely, of course, because we're working in the, in the present uh, here and now. So anything then can come up. So can I be my best self, be fully present with my clients so that we can, we just get to do some meaningful work. Please take your seats. As we move into resilience in the last 15 minutes, I know 15 minutes is really not a lot of time for resilience, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's define uh, resilience, what it is. And we are going to start with Rick Hansen once again. If you want to dive deeper into resilience research, he wrote a book called Resilient. And I would highly recommend his book. Um, he gives, it's a very practical book, lots of uh, tools and tips that you can actually share with your clients. Uh, Rick's definition of resilience is our ability to cope with adversity and push through challenges in pursuit of opportunities. Now, let's have a very quick reflection. We'll go for about, I'll give you 30 seconds, and I'm going to reflect on you on these two questions. How resilient do you think you are? And what has helped you so far in your journey to deal with challenges? Maybe just closing your eyes for a moment, just a quick self-reflection. And that's what it is, isn't it? Mindfulness. Because guess what? This is the only, only time we have anyway, if you really think about it. Your past is gone forever. It's stored in your hippocampus, which stores your memories, but you can't bring it back. The future never seems to arrive. There is always going to be a tomorrow. So what we're left with is, as you're saying, this moment, which is the only moment. So if you want to actually make some change in our lives and transform, this is the time to do it. And according to the research, I know that's not the case in this room, but according to the research out there, half of the time, almost half of the time, you're missing this point. You're just missing the moment. So this is why mindfulness is important and this is why it helps you with the resilience because rather than um, going into catastrophizing all or nothing thinking, you can actually just be factual. What is happening right now? What do I have to do? We're going to go through a very quick model, um, resilience in three steps. Um, and some of it is based on Martin Seligman's work, um, the founder of um, positive psychology. So. Basically, whenever we experience a success, um, a failure, a mistake, there is an emotional component to it. Yeah, it is basically, it's, it's almost like an emotional storm hitting us. And when that happens, the first point is, can I just find that calm and peace within myself before doing anything? And this is where mindfulness comes in. Because if I'm emotionally triggered, if, if, there, if I'm in the middle of that storm, I can't really see clearly what is going on. So first of all, yes, thank you, Kathy. Uh, first of all, uh, finding that inner calm and inner peace. Maybe taking a couple of deep breaths. Maybe just taking a day off. The second bit is emotional resilience. Noticing what emotions are showing up. And I'm pretty sure you may be noticing the same things. When we work with clients, they don't want to feel certain emotions, do they? You know, joy is okay, happiness is okay, but they don't want to feel the sadness or the shame or the fear. So when that happens, the emotions really get stuck in the body. So my suggestion is embrace the emotions as they come up. Right? Let it work through your body. Get into the somatic experience. What does that feel like in the body? And work with it. There has been some studies around people who are going through tra transitions. And the ones who are actually feeling these experiences as they go through transitions go through these times a lot quicker compared to the ones who just basically want to suppress their emotions. In Gestalt therapy, this is what we call the unfinished business. So whatever is not felt needs to be felt so that it is complete. And the third component is um, the cognitive resilience, how am I talking to, the, to myself and how am I relating to this experience? And this is really based on uh, my, um, Martin Seligman's work. And when we look at this, he really talks about two um, point of views. 
So when something happens, what point of view do I take? Do I go into pessimism and personalize the experience? Maybe a failure becomes, I am a failure. Uh, it becomes permanent. A mistake becomes permanent. It's like, oh, it's like this all or nothing thinking, right? Whenever there's a mistake, I have just failed and my life is ruined. And it also means that it applies to all areas of your life versus another point of view, which is optimistic, just realizing, you know what? Okay, this is a mistake. Um, it's based on the causes and conditions. It's temporary. It is going to change. And this is what mindfulness really helps us to understand. The only cost constant in life is the change itself. So whatever you're experiencing right now is bound to change sooner or later. Can you sit with it rather than suppressing it? And... Um, it only applies to certain circumstances. So you may have be you may be having some challenges in certain areas of your life, but some other areas may be going great. So just remembering these points of view and helping our clients to shift from that state of pessimism, from all of nothing, black or white thinking, into into you know different ways of um, uh, thinking, which are more optimistic. All right. So how do we improve our um, Resilience. When I was reading Rick's book, the first chapter was actually in compassion. It was the first chapter is dedicated to compassion. So this is really about treating ourselves with kindness and compassion. How would you treat a good friend who is going through a challenging time? Rather than activating that inner critic, what would you do? Maybe just hand around your heart, self-soothing practices. Getting into that state of self-compassion, know that this is a painful moment and pain is part of life. So can I just be compassionate with myself as I'm going through this? Mindfulness and self-awareness, obviously I'm not going to say much about this, but um, gratitude works really well. Now as we talked about the negativity bias, gratitude is the antidote of it. Who is keeping a gratitude journal? Great, a couple of people. Now. Can I just ask you to find three things that you're grateful for that happened to you today? And can you start feeling? I'm more interested not in the thought, I'm interested in the feeling. Can you start feeling the gratitude in your body? And can you tell me what that feels like? Where is it? Around here? Yeah, warm, fuzzy feeling around here. Anybody else? Freeing. Freeing. Where is it in your body? Get into the body. This is what we want to do. Like, well, at least this is what I do with my clients. Like, where do you feel it? This is part of the emotional intelligence. Where do you feel it? Around your head? Okay. Anybody else? Anybody feels anything around the chest? Yeah. What do you feel? Breath of fresh air. Breath of fresh air. Maybe some openness and maybe some lightness. So... Now, this is really crucial. How can we start training our minds and ourselves to notice the positive emotion as they're happening? Because if we don't, the mind will find the negative. It will go for it like a dog with a bone. Yeah. So this is your role to train your minds and to teach your clients how to do that. Um, exercise um, goes without saying. It really helps us to get into a better resilient state, and growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So a growth mindset is really about noticing what is the goal in this experience. Yes, it might be a challenge. Yes, maybe I failed at something, but what can, what can I learn? How can I better myself? How can I improve myself? Versus a fixed mindset is, well, oh, life is just, you know, this life sucks. I can't do anything. Just victim versus, you know, what can I do? What can I do, do differently? And guess what? As humans, this is how we learn. Yeah. Anybody who hasn't failed in this room? Yeah? <laughs> okay. This is part of our human nature. We stumble, we fall, we stand up, we go again. This is how we learn. And I tell to all of my clients, if you're not failing, then you're probably not trying really hard. Go fail. But I reframe that state of failing. I do it like, this is your learning opportunity. This is a learning for you. What can you learn? Go try something new. Get out of that st fixed mindset of comfort zone. Social connections, obviously, they really go without saying. 
cultivating those relationships that are going to support you along the path and changing your focus and changing your um, physiology. Um, now, obviously, when we're going through challenges, the focus is what is not working, what is not going well. Um, so how can we start bringing gratitude and cut through that, cut through that illusion that life is all bad? And mindfulness or three breaths or a minute of micro, micro practice, it can help us to come to our senses. And when we come to our senses, when we're in the present moment, then we can respond to the situation rather than, as Shona was saying, react. And this is often what's going on, automatic reactions. We're not, we're not present. The mind is just reacting, which is doing the same thing again and again. And when that happens, we're then re-strengthening that neural pathway in our brain. So that's why it be, like change is difficult for many because we have been carving these pathways in our brain for years. And people come to us, I want to change. Oh, well, that will take a bit of time and commitment and dedication and practice. Okay, so based on what you've learned today, what is one or two things that you can bring into your life that was useful or that, that you think may be useful to you. Can you just have a very quick reflection? I know we do have about two minutes remaining. <laughs> Mindful minute? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you, for, everybody got something by the way? Okay, good. Here is the challenge to you. Can you commit to this for the next 30 days? You, you, you're up for it? Yes. Okay. So can you send me an email? You got my card. At the end of those 30 days, just let me know what happened to you. So what was the practice? Or maybe just find an accountability partner here and start keeping yourself accountable. Because when we say like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, and then life happens. So if you do have an accountability partner, and this is what happens when we have clients on a regular basis, yeah, so what was the action? What was the committed action if you're using ACT? And did they do it? If they didn't do it, what came in the way? Same principle applies to us. Now, here is a very quick summary about what we covered today. We looked at neuroplasticity and um, being in an autopilot mode. We looked at the benefits of mindfulness, how to implement a, mind, a daily mindfulness practice. Because if it's not done on a regular basis, it's not going to be as effective. How to improve resilience, some tips around that. And creating your um, action plan for well-being. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you had some good insights about what mindfulness is and how we can cultivate a bit more resilience in our lives. And I think one message that I would like to leave you with, these are my contact details, by the way, if you, if you need to get in touch. So you've heard of my story in terms of from depression into mindfulness into speaking to you here today. If I can do this, you can do this. If you can do this, then your clients can do this too. So once you go out that door, I really want you to remember and bring that hope to every person that you touch. Thank you so much.